Today is February 14th, 2016, and it's part three of our study of the book of Titus, Paul's letter to Titus. It's part three. Again, today is February 14th, 2016. And here we go. This week is the behavior of the overseer. Last week we dealt with the behavior of the body. This week we're going to deal with the behavior of the overseer, the pastor, the leader. All right? Um, and we're pulling from several sources. Titus 1, Titus 2, and Titus 3 are our core texts today. So Titus 1, verse 1 to 3. Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to build up the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness and the hope of eternal life that God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. In his own time, he has revealed his message in the proclamation that I was entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. And we talked about when we first began that this passage makes clear that it is God's purpose, God's message, God's time, and God's method. So when we hear conversations about why doesn't God do this and why doesn't God do that, and the various types of theological hoops that people jump through in order to create a God that has a salvific love for everyone, and it's just the people that don't choose, and, you know, how can God send to hell people who've never heard the gospel, and all those other kinds of things. This passage makes clear that it is God's purpose, it is God's method, it is God's time, and it is God's message. Mm -hmm. Titus chapter 2, verse 1, but you must say the things that are consistent with sound teaching. Chapter 1 ends with what other people are doing. Chapter 2 begins with what you, I, as leaders, elders, must do. We have to say the things that are consistent with sound teaching. As Stephen so aptly said, you can't live it unless you believe it. You can't believe it unless you know it. Okay? So in order to say things that are consistent with sound teaching, you must know what sound teaching is. Okay, that's the speaking part. Here's the living part. Chapter 2, verse 7b and verse 8. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be ashamed having nothing bad to say about us. Now remember, right before this, he is laying out the qualifications of an overseer, and he lays out the fact that an overseer, the person, must be beyond reproach. And now he continues by saying the message is to be sound beyond reproach. So not only your lifestyle and your living, but your message. Right? Chapter 2, verse 15, say these things and encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Notice that encouraging and rebuking are together. Why? Because a rebuke is really correction. It is really correction. That's what the word means here. So encourage and correct with all authority. Chapter 3, verse 1 to 3, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, and to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. For we too... There's nobody there. No, come here. Thank you. We're all safe. We're all safe thanks to you. Okay. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. So there are a couple of reasons that he lays out here in the longer passage, which we'll really get into the meat of it next week. We have to live before the world in a way that exalts Christ. And we have to do so because 
of the message, right? We talked about this before. It's not about you, it's about the message. But also because this is the way that we used to be. Okay? This is the way that we used to live. Now we're going to talk next week about this passage and abuse of this understanding because all too often believers act as though they need to be just like the world in order to reach the world. And that is a lie. And we're going to talk about that next week. This week, your life, your message, and your purpose. Your life, your message, and your purpose. Colossians 4, 2-6. to six. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the message, to speak the mystery of the Messiah for which I am in prison, so that I may reveal it as I'm required to speak. Act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Your speech should always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. I found it stunning when we read through this before that Paul is not saying, pray for me that I get out of prison. He's saying, pray for me that I'll have opportunities to preach. Pray for me that God may open a door to us for the message, to speak the mystery of the Messiah for which I'm in prison, so that I may reveal it as I'm required to speak. Pray that when the opportunity comes along, or better yet, pray for the opportunity. I'm not so much concerned about my current situation. It's a light and momentary struggle, which does not compare to the absolutely incomparable right, weight of glory that's coming. So I want you to pray for me that I'm able to stand in the midst of my circumstances and preach the gospel as I'm required to do. You act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. In other words, stay away from frivolous, stupid conversations, petty arguments, situations like that. Act wisely toward outsiders. You never know who's watching you. You never know what the, the option or opinion is that they have about you or Christians is, be ready. Your speech should always be gracious, seasoned with salt. What does that mean? Tell the truth. Tell the truth with grace, but tell the truth. I find it interesting that he, that he uses the, uh, to speak the mystery of the Messiah. Well, the God becoming flesh is a mystery. Yeah. How does that happen? How does, how does the person whom the Jews were looking for to come and, and set up a kingdom and drive out the Romans come as a, a, a carpenter who in fact is declaring a kingdom, but it's not of this world? It's a mystery. Yeah. We live in a culture that, that well, that, that's the thing. We, we, we put up it's exactly what you read before. There's a mystery in it that we just have to, that we learn to accept. Right. We don't understand how God saves people. No. We don't understand why God saves who he saves. All of it is a mystery. He says in Thessalonians, behold, I tell you a mystery, right? We are going to be changed. I can't explain exactly how it's going to happen, but I know it's going to happen. And people are so busy trying to figure it out, and they're saying it's a mystery. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. Now, that does not mean, as some people have taken this to the extreme and, and made things that should be able to be explained inexplainable, unexplainable, shouldn't do that. We have to know the word and be able to rightly divide it, right? So act wisely with outsiders, making the most of the time. Your speech should always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. And again, Titus 2, 7, and 8, make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach so that the opponent will be ashamed. 
having nothing bad to say about us. Okay? So it's not that you are supposed to be ashamed in the face of your opponent. Your opponent is supposed to be ashamed in the face of your sound teaching. Now, let's look at what it means to be disqualified. Okay? So we have a case study of a disqualified leader. Now, we have leaders that are in pulpits today and in this country and around the world who have no business being in the pulpit. They are disqualified. Remember, we talked about this. You have to be beyond reproach. That word in the Greek speaks to being convicted. You have to be someone who cannot be accused and convicted. Okay? There isn't anything that somebody should be able to bring to you as a reproach because that will hinder the message, regardless of your talent. So here we have a case study in disqualified leadership, Mr. Daryl Gilliard. Okay? Daryl Gilliard, who is currently in a pulpit. I just grabbed a news article about him. Steve, you'll probably remember this because when he first came out of prison, it was during the time that I was doing the blog talk radio show, and I did a couple of times mentioned him because I just found it completely ridiculous and horrifying that he was in the pulpit. Yes, it's familiar. I remember. All right. So as of April 25th of 2014, a judge in Florida changed the probation terms for Daryl Gilliard, a preacher who is a registered sex offender, to allow the former Southern Baptist pastor to minister to children in his church. When he first came out of prison, this closing, failing church hired him because of his preaching gift. Okay? His, his talent for, for preaching, the way that Baptists like to be preached to. Because they figured he could draw a crowd and get people to come. Well, that worked. When he first came out of prison, children were not allowed to be in the sanctuary while he was preaching under terms of his probation because he's a registered sex offender. Why was he a registered sex offender? Because he was raping children. In 2019, he pleaded guilty to lewd or lascivious conduct and molestation involving two girls younger than 16. In 2007, he resigned after 15 years as a pastor of Jacksonville Shiloh Metropolitan Baptist Church, a 7,000-member, predominantly African-American congregation. It marked the fifth pastorate he lost due to allegations of sexual misconduct. <laughs> How do you get three, four, five, six chances to get back in the pulpit, to get access to people's kids, to go on raping. I submit that the body of Christ will do that. All right. All right. I didn't hear what Stephen said. I said I submit that the body of Christ does not do that. Right. These people that have done this several times over and over again are not members of the you know, that, That's right. Yeah, we're, and where are the elders? Right, even to the point of what we said before, even the ones that aren't appointed, where are the other men in the church? Where, where are they? Okay, exactly. Not, not only that, his life story was a lie. He rose up through the ranks in the Southern Baptist Convention under in the late 18, excuse me, the late 1980s. Falwell even gave him a platform to share on national television his dramatic testimony of growing up a homeless orphan who lived under a bridge a story that was later discredited. That should have been it right then. <laughs> the attention that he got from Falwell helped him attain several pastorates until confidence in him eroded after a series of sex scandals in the early 1990s. The Dallas Morning News published stories in 1991 saying dozens of women had accused him of sexual misconduct with some alleging rape. This man is back in the pulpit. 
Now, there are those who would say, well, what about being restored? What about restoration? They've repented of their sins. We should restore them. We can restore them to fellowship in the body exactly. if they are repentant, but we cannot restore them to the pastorate. And because the structure is already upside down and not what Jesus taught, they don't know how to apply that teaching. Exactly. It's it's what I what I've said so many times is that you may be forgiven, but that doesn't mean the consequences go away. That's exactly right. And people are selective in the way that they uh, restore people. You but, know, when you when you are not looking at what God wants you to do, you can restore people to leadership functioning, knowing that they're not who they are supposed to be in God's sight. Right. Well, by then you're not you. You've walked away from God as well. Well, by this the time is you it. Get there, yeah. I'm about that that church that hired him out of prison, mm -hmm. and 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 the judge that's saying. Let, let him go back towards children mm -hmm. in, in the environment of children. He, that judge too, needs to be removed. Well, the judge but didn't do anything the wrong. The judge, because, well, because, anything right there. well, here's the thing according to the law, okay, according to the law, he got out of jail in December of 2011. He served right. his probation. He did what had to be done. That's the law. Now, but we're not talking about what men do. We're talking about what the body of Christ is supposed to be doing. Exactly. I don't I don't care if he never touched another child. I don't I don't the issue is that he is as a as a pastor, he is disqualified. He's still True. able to be in the body. He's still he can be restored, redeemed, all of the rest of that. Okay, but you can't get up in the pulpit again saying you're somebody's pastor. That's over because you have to be beyond above reproach. This man is not. It's difficult, but y'all got one down there in Atlanta that should not be in a pulpit. Once those yeah. allegations came forth and there were four or five young men who all had the same story to tell, you had to sit down. Uh, you don't have to travel so far to find it. No, no, no. I'm sure there's there's a lot going on in Brooklyn. I'm, you know, I'm just saying stuff that that we would immediately recognize. Once these things happen, you are disqualified. But if it's already wrong in the first place, why 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 should any of the other rules apply? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Agreed. Agreed. So why don't we just of all those qualifications, period, it's just a hassle. Right, because he can preach. Yeah. The whole thing's been upside down for centuries, completely against the teachings of Christ. So why why start following the rules now? Because huh. maybe somebody cracks a book and says, wait a minute, it says this. You certainly look for qualifications when you go under the knife, right? Yeah, right? Right? You, you, you look for a qualified surgeon. Well. But pastors and presidents, not so much.